we've got a lot of scripture to go through today, so hopefully I don't go too over time. Um, but so so last week last week we talked about um, the topic of why all babies go to heaven, um, and we talked about you know how um, babies or, or people are born um, without the knowledge of the law. So even though we sin from birth, our sin is dead, and that's why if a baby dies, they would go straight to heaven because they are not held accountable for their sin. Now the reason why I called the sermon Why All Babies Go to Heaven and not Why All Children Go to Heaven is because I don't believe all children go to heaven. Uh, I do believe all babies go to heaven. But I just wanted to address the topic of why all babies go to heaven and talk specifically about babies because I did mention last week that I didn't want to touch on the age of accountability because that's what I wanted to touch on this week and talk about the age of accountability. So whilst I don't think the principle we talked about last week only applies to babies, and you know maybe that's what age would you give, maybe under a month, I do also think it applies to very young children, but I don't think it applies to all children. Because I do think the Bible um, refers to children as anyone under 20. Um, but I guess that's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to just, well, I'm going to talk about you know, the age of accountability. At what point in time does somebody, is somebody then held accountable for their sin? Um, and what age is that? So let's broaden the topic today to discuss the age or point in time a child becomes accountable for their sin. Now, first, first thing I want to say is um, just explain the differing views on this topic that I'm aware of. Because obviously there could be a multitude of views that I'm not aware of. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I only ever thought that there was one view. Because I thought the one view was, well, we don't know the age, right? Nobody knows the age of accountability. And, and it's just a, a, a period of time where somebody, a child comes to the understanding. Um, but I learned, I, re I learned recently that there is a different view. And I just wanted to go over that with you and then explain why I don't have that view and why I have the view that I do. So one view is that the age is unknown, the age of accountability. We don't know what the age is, but there comes a point in time where the child has knowledge. And when they have knowledge, now they're held accountable and they need to believe on Jesus Christ, which is my position. Um, the other position is that the age of accountability is 20 years old. Um, the age of accountability is 20 years old. And I just want to show you the verses that are used in order to support this view. Because you might be thinking, 20 years old? How, how can the age of accountability be 20 years old? But when you look at the verses, it is a reasonable position. But I'll explain to you as I go into the sermon why it's not my position. But we, we, looked, we, cut, we went to a couple of these verses last week, but we'll just go there quickly again so you can see them. Uh, Deuteronomy 1, verse 34. And the Lord heard your voice. And remember, this is the, them going into the, uh, the promised land and sending in the spies. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. By Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now this is the key verse. Moreover, your little ones, uh, moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey, and your children. So just note the phrase there, little ones and children. So this is not only referring to babies, this is referring to all young people. Which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. So I hope I'm representing the view correctly, but from what I understand is they'll take this passage and they'll say, look, well, the reason why they were led into the promised land, we learned in Hebrews, they were not led in because of unbelief. And then they say, see, the, the little ones had no knowledge between good and evil, tying in what we learned last week with Romans 7, and saying that's why they were led in, right? Because they did not know between good and evil, they were led in. Then we go to Numbers, where we actually see uh, the events unfold where the spies were sent in, and then they come back, and you have the eight spies saying, you know, giving an evil report, you have two spies, Caleb and Joshua, are giving a good report, and the people decided to believe the eight spies, right? And then they didn't go in, right? They murmured and, and wanted to even to the point of stoning uh, Caleb and Joshua. <clears throat> well, they wanted to, they didn't obviously stone them. 
And we read here in Numbers 14, 26, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me, saying unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. So this is basically where God says to the people who didn't want to go into the promised land, he basically says, hey, well, you're going to die in this wilderness. You're not going to go in. And look at this. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole family, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into that land, into the land, concerning which I swear to, to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephani, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, so again, remember what we read in Deuteronomy 1, but your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they, thou, they shall fall in this wilderness. And then um, it goes on with the story. So the view goes like this. So, you know, children, we, you know, uh, don't have this uh, knowledge between good and evil. We see that the example in Deuteronomy 1, where they were, were not able to enter in because of unbelief, it mentions that children don't have the knowledge between good and evil. And then Numbers 14, it shows that the children that didn't have the knowledge between good and evil was everyone under 20. So that's how they come to that, that, um, that conclusion that, hey, at 20 years old is actually when you um, now, uh, I guess, know the difference between good and evil, you're accountable for your sin, and then um, that's the age of accountability. Now, if you look at it the way, like you're probably thinking, now yeah, that sounds reasonable, right? That sounds, you're thinking, well, that sounds reasonable. So maybe the age of accountability is 20 when it's explained that way. Um, and, and a point I just want to make here is, you know, it does sound reasonable if your basis for this doctrine starts from the Old Testament and, and, and doesn't, I think, take into account what we learn in the New Testament. But another thing I just want to say is, you know, when we disagree on, on doctrine, you know, disagree on the basis of Scripture, you know, because uh, I don't know if you got, for those of you who are on Facebook, you know, obviously we post these things on Facebook and sometimes discussions will ensue, not just with uh, sermons about our church, but also sermons from other churches and things that people post. And, you know, I'm often very disappointed with brothers and sisters in Christ insulting each other, personal attacks against each other, insulting each other's intelligence when they're discussing the Bible. I mean, I think, you know, the, the spiritual thing to, to do as brothers and sisters in Christ is be able to discuss things in love, you know, keep the peace, you know, be able to discuss the Bible without insulting one another's intelligence because we all want to know what the Bible says, you know. So I just think it's funny that often it's the people that think they're the most spiritual, right? They think they're the most spiritually mature, and yet when they get zealous about doctrine, they're the ones that so quickly get into the flesh and are throwing personal attack and throwing insults. You would think somebody that is more spiritually mature would have the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no more. So that, that tells me that the Bible is saying, you know, you can never have enough of those things, right? Because there's no law forbidding you from having more fruit of the Spirit. So I think um, your spiritual maturity shows in, you know, how much fruit of the Spirit you have, not necessarily how much doctrine you know. And I'm not saying that doesn't mean knowing doctrine is not important. It is very important, right? But we just have to remember, I think personally, you know, your character, the fruit of the Spirit is more important than doctrine. Ideally, we want both, right? But I think a lot, a lot of the time, Christians in our circle, we get so focused on the doctrine and get so zealous about the doctrine, which is good, but don't throw out the fruit of the Spirit in the, um, at the same time. So, you know, this, you know, this is a reasonable view if you look at it this way. So it's not that people who believe this are stupid or are not intelligent. You know, they, they have a basis and it's a biblical basis for why they believe the things that they do. So if we want to, you know, go against and say, hey, why don't I accept this view? Well, then you have to offer an, a viable alternate explanation, right? You can't just say, ah, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't like it. and just offer your opinion. You have, to, you have to say, okay, that's what the Bible says. But is there another explanation for what this, these verses mean that give a different opinion? And is that more reasonable? Um, that's how we have to come at it. So there are two views that I know of. So there's the 20-year-old view. There's the unknown age view, which is my position. 
But you know, if if I was if I was pushed for an age, and I don't I don't believe this, but I just wanted to show you this verse, these verses, because they were a bit interesting. Talking about splitting up ages, because if somebody really pushed me for for an age, and I said, well, what's my best guess at what age the age of accountability is? I might say five years old, you know. But I, I, I but my, that doesn't mean my position is five years old. I'm just saying that would be my best guess, and I'm not going to be dogmatic about that because. You know, I, I don't think that's the right application of these verses. If I look here in Leviticus 27, it says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the person shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. So it talks about how the monetary value of different ages of people. And I just want to show you here the breakdown. It says, And thy estimation shall be of the male from twenty years, even unto sixty years old, even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. And if it be from 5 years old, even unto 20 years old, um, then thy estimation shall be of the male 20 shekels, and for the female 10 shekels. And if it be from a month old, even unto 5 years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male 5 shekels of silver, and for the female thy estimation shall be 3 shekels of silver. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. Um, and then it goes on to say, if you can't afford the estimation of the different things you should do. <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you the breakdown there. So you see the breakdown is one month, zero to one month, and then one month to five years, and then five years to 20 years, and then 20 years to 60 years, and then 60 years and above. So do we get a glimpse into the different age breakdown? You know, I don't think that's we can dogmatically apply those verses those way because this is about monetary value with a Levitical ordinance. So we can't just run with this and build a doctrine on it. But if somebody was to push me for an age breakdown, I, I mean, this, this is interesting that God gives the breakdown this way. You know, from one month to five years to 20 years to 60 years and 60 years and above. You say, the, um, why is the estimation of somebody that was from 20 to 60, 50 shekels of silver, but Jesus was sold for 30 shekels of silver? I believe it's because um, if you are classified as a servant, I think if you lose, if a master loses a servant, he's reimbursed 30 shekels of silver. So I don't know if that has something to do with Jesus being priced at 30 shekels of silver. When Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery, he was sold for 20 shekels of silver because he was between 5 and 20, because he was a young man. So, you know, and, but, you know, you might ask, well, what, what do the ages represent? You know what, I don't really know. But, you know, I could speculate that maybe at a month old, from my own experience, is that when a child becomes, like, sort of self-aware? Because, you know, when a baby is newborn, they don't really know what's going on. They don't know that, you know, it's just all instinct. But it seems that about one month old, they start to be more aware of things. Like, Abel now, he's starting to take notice of things. You know, he's noticed that we're there. Is, there. is it the age of, like, self-awareness, where they just know what's happening around them? Who knows? And then your five years, is that the age of accountability? You know, where they start to acknowledge that, or they start to understand the law and they're accountable for their sin? Maybe, maybe not. I do think 20 years old is when a man becomes an adult, you know, and they are um, now a man not under the authority of their parents. And then 20 to 60, and then 60 is um, probably when you're you know, a senior citizen. Maybe that's the retirement age. 60 years old, who knows? So, so just a thought there, but you know, I would not apply necessarily this verse. It's just if somebody pushed me for an age, maybe I'd say, hey, you know, this is a reasonable explanation for why we would break down the ages we do. Um, God seems to classify those ages differently. But like I said, I would not be dogmatic about that just because this verse doesn't have anything to do with spiritual accountability. It's about monetary value of different ages of um, men and women. Okay, so those are the two different views. Um, so somebody might say, you know, but how can you take the view of um, that the age of accountability is an unknown age, where we are given ages in the Bible? You know, Deuteronomy 1, they weren't allowed to let in, and Numbers 14 20, it says 20 years old and upwards. Well, let me explain why I um, take the view that it's an unknown age. <clears throat> So my first point is, in this explanation, is, you know, we need to start, I just want to explain a principle to you. Because when, when you're studying the Bible and you're understanding the Bible, we need to start with the principle that, um, well, let me explain this way. In, in the Bible, right, there, and, and this, I, I did not come up with this, so obviously a preacher that all, a lot of us listen to, 
says this as well. But in the, in the Bible, there are stories and there are statements, right? There are examples and stories of things that happened. And then there are statements which actually explain, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And a very good principle to have is we need to interpret these stories in the Bible with statements in the Bible. A good example is, you know, stories in the Bible, people had multiple wives, they had concubines, they did all these things in the Old Testament that they shouldn't necessarily have done. And we know that they're wrong because we interpret those stories based on the statements in the Bible, based on the commandments. But I don't think that principle is complete, meaning I don't think it's enough to just say we need to interpret the Bible stories with statements. Because I would, what I would add to that is we need to interpret the Bible stories with Bible statements in light of the New Testament. Because we can't just take a Bible statement to interpret a Bible story and not take into account that a change has taken place from the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Right? So, a couple of examples of that is... Well, I just want to show you a couple of verses quickly um, to show that in the Old Testament, they did, they did not have all knowledge. You know, they, they didn't know everything. There were things that were hidden. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. And I'm not going to go through all the verses in my notes. Um, so, if you want all of them, you can check out the blog later. Look here in 1 Corinthians 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So the wisdom always existed. And that, that lines up with in the beginning was the Word, right? The Word being eternal. The wisdom of God was always there. But it was hidden. And then at certain points in time, God revealed more and more wisdom, revealed more and more in that Word. He manifested His Word through preaching, we learn in Titus. So it says here, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. We, Paul the Apostle here, referring to you know, him and the people that were ordained to preach the Word of God in the New Testament, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. As it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And yeah, it's interesting, you know, sorry I'm going off on different trails here. I just think it's interesting that verse, you know, often we think of that verse as, as heaven, right? Saying, we don't know what's going to happen in heaven, I have not seen nor yet heard the things that God has prepared for them that love you. But here, isn't Paul saying here that the things that I have not seen nor yet heard are the things that was the hidden wisdom that are now revealed to Paul? So maybe it's saying, hey, before I have not seen nor yet heard, and now that Jesus Christ is revealed and the wisdom given to the apostles in the New Testament, now I have seen and ear heard, right? And we have this spiritual understanding. Um, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. <clears throat> which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And that really is the springboard verse that people will jump from to say, hey, yeah, the Bible is its best commentary. You want to find out what the Bible means before running to a dictionary or before running to a commentary. I don't necessarily have anything against those, but before going to those, shouldn't we just check out what the Bible says about itself? You know, let's compare spiritual things with spiritual. That's where we get this, the, the principle of interpreting Bible stories with statements. But we also have to compare spiritual with spiritual because we need to take into account also the New Covenant, which has changed things to interpret the statements we read in the Old Testament. Um, and I'll just turn to one more uh, verse in regards to that point. Uh, look at this verse here. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. So you see there that there was wisdom that was hidden, wisdom that was not known in other ages, but is now made known. First Peter. Look at what Peter writes here in First Peter. 
says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So talking about the plan of salvation, how we're saved. And look in verse 10. Of which salvation, so this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow after, so that, that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So he's saying here that the Old Testament prophets, they preached the word of God. They preached the suffering of Christ, but they searched the scriptures trying to figure out how and when and how, or how the things were going to happen. But now that it was revealed in the New Testament, we know exactly how it all happened. Because we look at it in the past, we know how Jesus came, how he fulfilled the law, how everything played out. In the Old Testament, they didn't know how it was all going to play out. And that's why when you read the New Testament, they're always saying like, you know, you're going to establish the kingdom now. And they're always asking Jesus, this is how it's meant to work. And you remember when John the Baptist was in jail, he's like, are you the one we're waiting for? Or do we look for another? Because the people in the Old Testament, when they only had the Old Testament scriptures, they were looking through a glass darkly. They didn't have all the knowledge and all the wisdom and the revelation we have now in the New Testament. And that's why they were a little confused because they're trying to figure these things out. But they're revealed to us in the New Testament. So a couple of examples of, remember, because we're talking about the principle. Now you take Bible stories, you interpret them with Bible statements, but you need to interpret Bible statements in light of the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Because what are some examples, maybe some controversial in our circle, where if you take statements in the Bible without, without uh, uh, interpreting them in light of the New Testament, you would actually get into false doctrine. One would be um, food laws. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, don't eat this, it's abomination to eat this. And if you don't take into account the principle in the New Testament that no man judge you in meat or in drink or in holy day or respect of the new moons or of the Sabbaths, which have been done away in Jesus Christ, you can't just take that statement and say, oh, it's wrong to eat pork because it's an unclean animal. Because we have to interpret it in light of the New Testament, right? And some other examples, you know, is the Sabbaths I just men mentioned. You know, another one is, you know, if you obey, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Because yes, there is the statement in the Bible that if you obey, God sets before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you all keep the commandments of the Lord, a curse if you disobey the commandments of the Lord. But if we don't interpret that in light of the new covenant, which is, hey, that was salvation by works. That was the old covenant, which nobody could keep. And if we apply that covenant to us now, we're all cursed. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. But we don't have to keep the works to be saved. It's not about repenting of your sins or keeping the commandments. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we interpret those Old Testament statements. Um, and the last one, you know, which is a bit more controversial, I just want to throw it out here. But, you know, like tithing, for example. Because tithing is a statement in the Bible. But if we don't take into account the New Covenant and the Old Covenant, I think there's a, there's a bit of debate there. But, you know, me personally, I think it has to do with the Levitical priesthood. Same with my position on musical instruments. It has to do with the temple worship and, 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 and um, um, Levitical priesthood and things like that. And I think, you know, you can have the wrong understanding, I believe, on these topics if you don't take into account the uh, New Testament scriptures and the new understanding that God has given us in the New Testament. So before I get into, you know, the age of accountability, I just wanted to give you that because that is really the principle upon which I build my thinking for the position I take in terms of the age of accountability. So with that in mind, let's go to Romans 7. <clears throat> where we learn this principle last week. So let's read from uh, verse 7. Because if you were to ask me, where, where do I get my position from and what do I base my position on? This is what I base it on. I base it on the principle that is given in the New Testament and then I use this to then interpret what I see in the Old Testament. So this is where it all begins. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandments. So it's saying this is how sin is revealed. 
wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. That's what we talked about last week. Law, sin being dead and not killing it yet, being born spiritually alive. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For, the, for those of you who weren't here last week, basically what that is saying is, the only reason why uh, we can know what sin is, is because of the law of God. And he's saying here, when he got the knowledge of the law of God, that's when the sin revived and he died spiritually. So this is where I start. I start with the principle, hey, what we see here is Paul's explaining that the moment a person is accountable for their sins is the point at which they have knowledge of the law. So when they have knowledge of the law, by that commandment, by that law, their sin revives and now they die. Right? And that's where I start. Now, the reason why I, I, I first of all, cannot accept that it's 20 years old, because we know for a fact, I mean, we know scientifically that people have this knowledge before 20 years old. How do we know that? Because people are saved before they're 20 years old. How can you get saved without the knowledge of the Lord? How can you believe on Jesus Christ and understand those scriptures and yet not understand the scriptures in regards to the law? I don't think somebody can understand, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and yet not understand the law when it's the same book that is explaining both. Do you know what I mean? Because that means they're understanding one part of the Bible, but they can't understand another part of the Bible. You know, but if they're old enough, they should be able to understand, you know, they're understanding that bit, they can understand the other bit. So we know, we know for a fact that this age where people have this knowledge of the law comes before 20. Not, not only that, people, people under 20 teach the Bible, don't they? I mean, you have church, I mean, we don't have it in our church, where people have, you know, children's church and Sunday school and things like that. And the people that are teaching those classes to those little children are people that are under 20 years old. So that means that people under 20 years old, they can understand the commandments, they can understand the law. So by this principle, that means they are capable of dying spiritually because they understand the law. Their sin has been revived and they die. But, you know, so with that in mind, you know, because I, I don't, I do not think you know, whilst I don't think necessarily, you know, science so-called should dictate our positions, obviously anything said in the Bible cannot contradict what we do see with science. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we might see something have the wrong interpretation and the Bible might conflict with our interpretation of those, of that science, and then we've got the wrong interpretation of the science, we need to rethink those things. But it's, if it's an observable fact that you can see people under 20 understanding the law, getting saved, teaching people the law, teaching people the Bible, I don't think it's easy then to take a position that that happens after 20 years old, right? So then the question then is, well then what is the explanation for Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 1 and Numbers 14? So I want to provide you a viable alternative, which I think is much more reasonable. So uh, let's go back to Deuteronomy 1. And the key verse we just want to focus on there, it says, Moreover your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. So, a couple of things there. Remember the principle I talked about is we have to interpret Bible stories. This is a Bible story, right? And then there's, there's a statement made, but then we have to, you know... Uh, interpret that statement based on what we know in the New Testament, which is, hey, but the point at which a person dies is when they know. But it seems like this verse is saying, well, they don't have the knowledge between good and evil. So how, Victor, how are you going to explain that? So one thing is, the way I see this verse, I think we just see a glimpse, right? I don't build my doctrine based on this verse, but I think we see a glimpse of the principle in Romans 7 that, hey, if we don't have knowledge, they're not held accountable. And we see here, they didn't have knowledge of good and evil. They weren't held accountable. 
I think the key to unlock the understanding of this verse is what does the Bible mean when it says the knowledge between good and evil? You know, so it's, it doesn't say here that they didn't have knowledge between right and wrong, right? Right meaning the law, sin, wrong meaning sin, right? It says they had no knowledge between good and evil. Now we know, maybe, maybe the, the newer guys here don't, don't know that we believe this, but you know, not all sin, not all evil is sin. Because God does evil. Remember God, when it talks about Nineveh, you know, God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So God can, because evil is not sin. Evil is when you harm somebody else. Good is when something good is done to you. Evil is when you are harmed, right? And God can also inflict harm, right? He killed Ananias and Sapphira for lying about how much they gave to church. He did evil to them. Did he sin? No, because God does not sin. So I think that's the key there, that they had no knowledge between good and evil. It doesn't mean that they didn't have knowledge between right and wrong. That they couldn't understand what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. They didn't have the knowledge between good and evil. So the question is, what is that knowledge of good and evil that they were referring to, that they didn't have knowledge of? Well, let's um, turn to Numbers 13. So we just go to the chapter before. Verse 25, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So here we pick up, Numbers 13 is when they went in, they spied out the land, they saw everything, and they cut off the grapes at Eskel, and they bring it to the people. So now they've returned. Verse 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought backward unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. These are the giants. And, and the, Amale the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So now they're starting to talk about the negative. And this is what I like about Caleb. He's like, Caleb still the people. So he's like, he's like cutting them off. He's like, whoa, 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 right? And Caleb still the people before Moses said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than us. And look at this key verse in verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land. Right? Evil report of the land. Just note that. Which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land though we, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. So what's this evil report? They're saying, if we go into this land, bad things are going to happen to us. Right? We're gonna, they're going to eat us up. And that's why they bring up this evil report, because that's what evil is. It's harm that's going to happen to them. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which, which come of the giants. Which we, were, which we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? So that's the reference there where it says, you know, you thought your children and your little ones would be a prey. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto e into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we passed through to search it, look at this, is an exceeding good land. You see, so you see the difference there that the, the, the bad, the spies, the eight spies were, were saying, hey, in there it's evil. They brought up an evil report. The two spies that believed the Lord said, hey, no, it's a good land. And they're trying to bring up a good report of the land that they're going into. Where did I go? Good land. Verse 7. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bread for us. 
So he's even saying, hey, even the things that are bad in there, they're good for us, bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So when we go back to Deuteronomy 1, right? What is this knowledge between good and evil? Is it saying here that the little ones are ignorant of the law and don't know the difference between right and wrong, and that's why they were led into the land? Or are they saying they didn't have knowledge of good or evil? Because what happened? The, eight, the ten spies came back. They raised the report, right? Eight of them said, hey, it's evil. Two of them said, no, 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 it's a good land. But did everybody else know necessarily? Because we could say, well, maybe that's why they didn't have knowledge between good and evil, because it was the men of the children of Israel talking. And it was the men that wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua. Maybe the women and the children, the little ones, weren't part of this discussion. So they don't even know the good and evil that would await them, and that's why they have no knowledge between good and evil. Now, another verse that could be brought up is Genesis 3. So in light of the understanding there of what good and evil is and the knowledge of good and evil, um, I just wanted to go quickly to Genesis 3. Um, because this is another verse um, that is used to support the other view. And whilst it's reasonable, I think there's another explanation in light of, just, of what we've just talked about. So Genesis 3.22. We're at the beginning now where obviously Adam and Eve are, are living in paradise, you know, sinless. And now they've just committed that sin of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not the, not the tree of the knowledge of right and wrong, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says here, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the contrary view at 20 years old will say, Ah, see, like they also, before they, before they reached that point of accountability, did not have this knowledge between good and evil. And, and then they apply that to then the Deuteronomy and Numbers verses. But with the understanding that I've just explained of the Numbers verse and the Deuteronomy verse where they did not know about the good that would await them or the evil that would await them, we can also apply that understanding to this. Not to say that Eve, Adam and Eve did not know the difference between right and wrong and did not understand the commandment of God, but that they didn't know the good and evil that would await them until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you say, well, then didn't they know good? They were living in paradise, right? So one way you could understand this is Number one, you could say, well, do you really know good without knowing evil? If, that's, if it's just good all the time, can you really say you understand good if it's always good for you? Or you can say they always understood good because that's how they lived, and now they know both. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, meaning they only knew good before, now they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now they know good and evil. But with that understanding, we can say, well, it's not that they were ignorant of the law, which is what we learned in Romans 7. Romans 7 is you're ignorant of the law, then when you understand the law, you die spiritually. Is that what's happening here? No, they don't know, they don't have the knowledge of good and evil, but do they have the knowledge of right and wrong? I believe they do, because when you go up, where am I going? Sorry, this laptop is getting old. Look here. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So this shows that Eve did have an understanding of the law. She did understand, Hey, this is what God said we can do. This is what God said we can't do. And she understood the punishment. That if you ate of the tree, or she added, you know, touch it, she says, we're going to die. So we can't say that Adam and Eve were ignorant of the law and apply it to the contrary view. They did know the law. They knew the punishment. And that's why they were held accountable for when they sinned. You know, because they understood. And now they know the difference between good and evil. And if we... Uh, compare that to the good and evil talked about in Numbers 14 that makes sense so that's how I think we can understand Deuteronomy 1 in light of Romans 7 um, and have a consistent view which I think is um, a little bit more reasonable in my 
my point of view and more biblical. All right, so then how then, let's go to Numbers 14. 14. So how then do we understand Numbers 14 uh, verses 26, what do we go through? 26 to 32, where it says, you know, but your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in, for they shall know the land which ye have despised. Sorry, I missed that. Verse 29. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So what then, with what we've just learned so far, what then is a reasonable explanation for Numbers 14? Why, why 20 years old? Why did God let everyone in over 20 years old? Why not, why not 5 years old? And, and down. If, 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 and this is not my position, but if we're held accountable at five years old, why didn't God, like, you know, make them wonder until everyone from five years old and up died? Right? And then, you know, wouldn't that line up and make more sense? So, why, why 20 years old? Um, let me just show you this verse here in Numbers 1. What's the significance of 20 years old? Now, if you just search the phrase 20 years old in the Bible, you'll learn very quickly why this age is significant. We've already covered one of them because one is the age of 20 is when you're accountable, right? Because the age of 20 is when you become a man and now you're accountable. And because at the age of 20, you are no longer under the authority of your parents as a man, you, you know, you, you have these choices to make. In, in the Old Testament, they were expected to go to war. Look at Numbers 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles. From twenty years old and upward, and look at this, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. So obviously we can't really talk about Numbers 14 without taking into account what happened in Numbers 1 and what's leading up to Numbers 14. So you know, like they've gone through the wilderness, they're now about to enter into the Promised Land the first time, we know that they didn't go in, and before that they're numbering the people. That's why the, the, the book is called Numbers, and they're counting up how many people. And one thing they're counting is how many males there are over 20 years old, because that's how big their army's going to be, because that's who's expected to actually go in and fight and claim the inheritance in the promised land. So, in light of that, why then is the 20 years old significant in Numbers 14? Because can God hold the men accountable who aren't able to go forth to war for not going forth to war? Because remember, there's an evil report from the eight spies, and then the men didn't want to go in. They're saying, oh, you know, we're better. we died in the wilderness, we went back to Egypt. So God is not holding the people under 20 accountable because it's from 20 years old and up where you're expected to go to war and it was those men that didn't want to go in. So he's saying, hey, you don't believe, you don't want to go to war, then you're not going to go in. The people that didn't know between good and evil, they're going to go in. Right? So that's the significance of uh, 20 years old. So even though Deuteronomy explains that these under 20 didn't have knowledge of good and evil from the spies, um, but does it mean that they didn't understand the law? Because even though they were under 20 and were not able to go forth to war, does that mean that they don't understand the difference between right and wrong? Not necessarily, if um, you look at it from that point of view. But like I said, I do believe it shows that physically we are accountable for our sons until the age of 20. So, you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but I think you could glean a principle from this to say, from 20 years old, you're no longer under the authority of your parents. And that's why you are expected to go to war and you're counted as one of the men of Israel, as one of the men of that nation. <clears throat> um, now one point here, you know, women though, women are always under the authority. So I think it only applies to men, and I won't go into, into, this, into, this, into this sermon, but I've preached about it before, that men, I think, come out of the authority of their family at 20 years old. Um, I think when it comes to women, though, the Bible talks about women, women always having power on her head. So I think women are always under the authority of a man. 
and it's a, their father first, and then when they get married, they, they move over to the authority of their husband. So, you know, the Bible says, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. So we, we, we learned not long ago that, you know, when a person gets married, they start a new family. So to understand this in full, my position would be at 20 years old, you're no longer under the authority of your parents. But if you get married and you leave the authority of your parents and start a new family, that could happen before you're 20. Because let's say you're married at 18 years old, you're no longer under the authority of your parents because now you're a new family. But I do believe up until 20 years old, you are under the authority of your parents. And obviously, you know, if you live with your parents, they may impose additional rules for giving you requirements to live in their house. And, but I think you're not doing wrong by saying, you know what, as a man, I don't want to live in this house anymore. You know, my own authority and I'm going to go um, do my own thing. I don't think you have to obey everything your parents say, but obviously you should still honour and respect them. So this is why... Um, <clears throat> See, because if you are only under your parents' authority until you were married, why then could Jesus go against his parents' authority when he wasn't married? And I won't turn to all these verses, but you guys are probably familiar with these passages. But you remember in John 2, you know, Mary says, hey, you know, they run out of wine and, and ask something of Jesus. And Jesus says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not yet come. And you kind of think like, well, that's, that's kind of a, you know, is that a, it's obviously not a disrespectful thing to say, but it shows that he's not subject to, to his mother because what he because when he began his ministry and he was baptized he was 30 years old so he didn't have to obey his mother and father anymore because he's no longer under their authority even though he's not married right the other thing is in luke um i will turn there just because i'll just turn there quickly if you remember the story when he was 12 years old and he, they, they 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 walked away and they left him in jerusalem he was talking with the doctors He's 12 years old here. Look at what it says here in... Um, uh, where is it? Ah, verse 51. And he says, and he, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So I just wanted to show you there how Jesus, when he was under 20, when he was 12 years old, he was subject to his parents. When he's over 20, when he was 30, he was no longer subject to Mary. He didn't have to do what Mary said. But obviously, I do believe that when a person mar gets married, it says you leave father and mother and cleave unto your wife. And I believe it's talking about leaving the authority of your mother and father and establishing a new family. The last thing as well, I just wanted to mention quickly about Numbers 14. Um, and I won't turn there, but Numbers 14, verse 40 and onwards, because this, we are still on the topic of hell, we see a glimpse of reprobacy meaning like when you're rejected of god because even though some people we believe can get rejected of god before they die ultimately everyone is rejected of god if they do not believe on the lord jesus christ and they die because what happened in numbers 14 is even though god said you know what you're going to die in this wilderness 20 years old and upward you're not going to go into that land if you don't know the story what actually happened is they wanted to go in anyway so after they told them, you know, Moses said, hey, you're not going in they rose up early in the morning and they said hey you know what we changed our mind we want to go in and, and, and the Bible says, you know, that God was no longer with them. And when they tried to go in, they, they were defeated and were not able to go in. And I, see we, I think we see a glimpse as well into the fact that when a person is reprobate, they can no longer be saved. When a person dies and they do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no second chances. You, even though in hell, I'm sure there are a lot of people in hell that have changed their mind and want to go into the promised land, but it's too late for them. Um... So that's how I think we can correctly understand Numbers 14. Now, the last point I want to make, let's go to Matthew 18. Because <clears throat> I just want to address this verse, so it's good. And, you know, I do appreciate, obviously, people that have a different perspective. It gives me material for my sermon. But also, um, it gives me some things to explain, to show what verses I use to support the contrary, and then I'll give you a, a vi Bible, I believe, explanation, and fit it in and with what we've learned so far, but also show you how it, I don't think it can fit in with the other view. So in Matthew 18, we see here Jesus talking about children and little ones, and talking about how they believe on Him, 
and how we should seek to emulate to be like children. So let's read from verse number 1, Matthew 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And this is the reason why we don't have children's church. You're wondering why, hey, why are all the children sitting here? Oh, they're, they're noisy. They, they sing loud. I like it that they sing loud. And they make noise. I can't, I can't concentrate. Blah, blah, blah. Well, we have them here because we want them to be part of the preaching, right? And we want to, to you know, I think adults should, you know, we need to suffer them, right? And, and let them be children. And we, you know, grow and try and pay attention to the sermon more. But this is one reason why we have the children here. Because look, because when Jesus preached, he says, Jesus called a little child on him and set him in the midst of them. So when Jesus preached, he had children listening to him. Jesus didn't say, okay, now we're going to preach. Let's get the children off into another room, into another building, because they're disturbing me. They're disturbing everyone. And you guys listen to the word of God, and then we'll give them some uh, down version in the other room. So this is why we have children here, because they, they do learn. Amen. They're here in the midst of us, and they were here there in the midst of Jesus. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the way the contrary view would interpret that, they would say, see, you have to be converted and become as little children because little children, you know, they, they, they're saved, right? You, if you become like a little children, then when you die, you'll go to heaven. But, but is, that, is that what Jesus is trying to say? Like, if Jesus is saying, I want you to be like a little child, remember the reason why a little child dies and goes to heaven is because they're ignorant. They're ignorant of the law. Is Jesus saying here, I want you to become as a little child. I want you to become ignorant of the law. So that, you know, so that you'll die. No, because obviously in order for a, an older person to get saved, they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he can't be saying become as a little child, meaning become ignorant of the law. He must be emphasizing a different attribute. And most of us, are what we would believe about this is that children very easily trust. They have great faith. They very easily believe. And he's saying, hey, you need to be converted and become as little children, not be ignorant of the law. But easily believe on Jesus Christ. Don't let your pride and your wisdom of this world get in the way of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I think he re-emphasizes this in verse 4. Because he says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Because we know pride is often the reason why people do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to humble ourselves as this little child. So the attribute that we are trying to emulate in little children is not ignorance. It's humility. Because humility is what allows us then to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're trying to emulate. This is what Jesus is saying here to say, be like these little children. And whosoever, whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now look at this, verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that, were they, and that he was drowned in the depths of the sea. Just uh, take note of that, and I'll just explain in a second. <clears throat> oh, and um, one point I did want to make, there's two points I want to make on verse 6. One is the fact that these little ones believe on Jesus Christ I think also supports the view that I've just expressed, which is it's not their ignorance we want to emulate. It's their humility. It's their faith. Because he's saying, hey, and then there's these little ones that believe on me. So again, I think it supports that view. Now, uh, uh, let's see what I want to do. <clears throat> now, Mark 9.42 is a parallel passage where Jesus also makes a similar statement. He says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. So we know that little ones are children, right? And I do believe it uh, does refer to those under 20. You know, I do believe, think you're a child if you're under 20 years old. He says, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast, and he were cast into the sea. Now, with that in mind, the fact that Jesus is saying, hey, these little children under 20 years old believe on me, we see here that it is possible for a person under 20 years old to believe on Jesus Christ. So now at this point in time, you're left with two possibilities, 
right? If you take the other view, you have to accept, you, or you, you may have to accept that children always believe. Well, okay, sorry, let's start again. If you have the contrary view, right, that 20 years old is the age of accountability, you're left with two possibilities to interpret this verse, I believe. One is children always believe on Jesus Christ. Which is obviously false. Because then, number one, whoever needs to get saved if we already believe on Jesus Christ because of eternal security. But if at 20 years old they die and go to hell, does that mean they lost their salvation? They believe on Christ and then they lost it? So obviously that is not a possibility, right? So that, that, is, one, that is one way you can take that verse, which is obviously false. The other way you take it is that a child is able to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without the knowledge of the law. Because if you say under 20 years old, they don't have the knowledge of good and evil, meaning in that interpretation that they do not have the knowledge of the law, they're ignorant of the law, that means you must accept that somebody under 20, a little one, is able to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without the knowledge of the law. Does that make sense? But I don't think that is possible. I, I do not believe it is possible for a person, like I was saying in the beginning, to believe on Jesus Christ and to understand the scriptures in regards to the redemption and yet at the same time not understand the scriptures to do with sin and um, the commandments. And I think I can prove this from the Bible and, and, and show that that view is not the right view to have. Um, Galatians 3.24 We did turn to this passage last week. But just to reiterate again, it says here in Galatians 3, 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So remember again in Romans it says that through the knowledge of the law, we have the knowledge of sin. But you could say, well, it doesn't give us the knowledge of the Savior. But then in Galatians 3 it says because of the law, the law is actually what brings us to Jesus Christ. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. A schoolmaster is somebody that teaches you something. So it's saying here the law teaches you about Jesus Christ. How then can a little one believe on Jesus Christ without understanding the law? If, if you take it that way. Um, look here, Romans 3. I won't read the whole passage, I was going to read a longer passage, but I'll jump down to the key verse, which is, <clears throat> talks about, you know, people that do not accept, um, you know, I guess people that have sinned, which is all of us. Verse 19, Romans 3. Now we know that what things soever saith the law, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. And look, it reiterates this principle that he talks about in Romans 7. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So you might think, is that a contradicting statement there? Because he's saying here, you know, the righteousness of God without the law. Does that mean they don't need to know the law and they can know the righteousness of God? But then it says, being witnessed by the law. So don't they need to understand the law if the law is witnessing about Jesus Christ? No, no, no. The, the way you need to understand that is it's saying now the righteousness of God without the law. It's saying because the righteousness is by faith, it's not by works. So there is a righteousness that comes that could come by the law, but because we can't keep the law, the righteousness is by faith without the law. Right? So we have this righteousness of God without the law, but look at this. But it says that the righteousness of God is witnessed by the law. Are you guys getting what I'm saying here? So you say, it's saying that, you know, if, if, a, if a baby... I'm just trying to show why the view of 20 years old accountability is wrong. Because, like I said, if, it, if 20 years old and under you're a child, but a child can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but a person under 20 years old can't understand the law, which is why they're not held accountable for their sin. But the Bible says here that the righteousness of God, which is how we believe on Jesus Christ and we're saved by faith, which those little ones in Matthew 18 were able to do can only do that because the law is what is witnessing of the salvation by faith. So the law is what witnesses salvation by works. It witnesses the commandments, but it also witnesses believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation without the law. Um, 
And look here, Acts 10, 23. So that's why Romans 7, when a child comes to that point where they understand the law, they also get the understanding of the righteousness of God without, faith, without the law, which is witnessed by the law. You know, because they understand sin, because when the law came, right, the commandment came, sin revived and they died. At the same time, they can also understand this, this law, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. <clears throat> Acts 10, 43. This is the Apostle Pe Peter, the Apostle preaching. To him give all the prophets witness. So remember in Romans 3, it says, oh, uh, was it Romans 3? Yeah. It's talked about being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Acts 10.43 To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. <clears throat> Romans 1.15 Paul says here So as much as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, those that believe on Jesus Christ, right? To everyone that believeth. Look at verse 17 though. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So he's saying, in the gospel of Christ, it's revealed that we need to believe on Christ to be justified by faith. But then he says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, which is an Old Testament law passage, right? It's part of the law. So I'm just trying to show you here that it's intertwined, that the understanding of the Bible is intertwined with understanding the need to believe on Jesus Christ, understanding what sin is. It all comes at a point when a person understands the law, they understand sin, they also need, at that point can understand that they need to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Last one I want to turn to. The, the, uh, Paul the Apostle writing to Timothy here says here in verse 14 but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of, who, knowing of whom thou hast learned them and look at this in verse 15 and that from a child so from when? from when he was under 20 right? and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So again, I think this is a verse. It doesn't just show that, you know, you know, I guess you could take this verse and say, yeah, well, a child can understand that they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They learn that from the scriptures. But then how then can you take the view if they can understand the law that witnesses of the truth of salvation, they don't understand, though, the law that condemns them? And would somebody believe on Jesus Christ without knowing they're condemned? I mean, there's a reason why when we explain the gospel, we explain, hey, you're a sinner first. You need to understand that you're condemned. Otherwise, how, how, if, without the knowledge of condemnation, how can salvation make any sense? What are you being saved from? Why believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't know that you're condemned to hell? So anyways, I hope that sermon was interesting for you and just delved in a bit deeper into this single topic. I, I did plan to actually uh, preach on the age of accountability in this ser series of going um, on about hell. Um, so what is the conclusion? You know, so I don't believe that we can know the age. I believe the age of accountability is based on knowledge of the law, which is based on Romans 7. And the Bible does not, I don't think it clearly defines what that age is. I think we can try and glean ages from the Old Testament, but I think it's stretching those passages a bit too much or having the wrong understanding. Um, so that's the conclusion. And I guess the application is, hey, you know, we need to get the gospel to our children as early as possible. Because um, we don't know when that age is. And that's why we've got to be teaching them and telling them about sin and judgment, as well as telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. So as early as possible, they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved.